let's start. Let's start with a few moments of uh, breathing. Two, three minutes just to calm the mind. And then I'll lead you through setting the motivation. And after that we do the prayers. Ah, okay, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll turn this off a little bit. Uh-huh. Does that work better? Can you hear me now? Also in the back? Even higher? Oh. Uh, volume to be a little bit higher. Okay, so how's it now? Can you hear me now? All right. I don't want to speak too closely into the microphone, otherwise this works, right? In the back you can hear me. Thank you. All right, so I said first we do a few moments of breathing, breathing meditation, then setting the motivation, and after that we do some prayers. So now let's set our motivation by thinking that may today and the next two days become the cause for us to understand the meaning of Nagarjuna's explanations. on emptiness and dependent arising. So that we can come to realize the meaning of these profound teachings. And to directly experience is taught here.
so that we are able to gradually remove all the obstructions that are not in the nature of our mind. to remove all the afflictive views and afflictive emotions. And eventually attain the enlightened state of a Buddha. So that we're able to exactly know what is best for each and every sentient being. To guide them out of their misery. Out of their fear, worry, hatred, and so in that way to be of greatest benefit to ourselves and all other living beings. So with this in mind, let's do the prayers. Page 10. The Buddha, the Dharma, the Kilai Levi, the Keshe Kilat Adlaya, the Tzota Mitzvuri, the Shabala Dharma, the Sikh Buddha Yud, the Deloi Levi, בבודה בדארמה ובקילה אלי, אבקש מקלט עד להערה, באמצעות המצבורים של הקשבה לדארמה, ועושים בודהו כדי להועיל את צורים על הנביא. בבודה בדארמה ובקילה אלי, אבקש מקלט עד להערה, באמצעות המצבורים של הקשבה לדארמה, ועושים בודהו כדי להועיל את צורים על הנביא. לא יזכו כל בעלי התודעה בעושר ובגורמי העושר. לא ייפרדו כל בעלי התודעה מסבל ומגורמי הסבל. ולעולם לא ייפרדו כל בעלי התודעה מעושר ומתון כאב. לא יפתחו כל בעלי התודעה את מידת ההשתוות ללא מסור פנים של התקשרות ושל סביבה. Now you all have this booklet, right? This booklet. Um, so this is a translation of some of the chapters of the Mulya Matyamika Karika, or as it's also called, the fundamental, uh, the verses of the fundamental wisdom, or fundamental wisdom by Nagarjuna. So these verses, the verses that I prepared here, and this is just a draft of a translation. I've already come across some things I'm not happy with. I keep changing it. Um, so these chapters here in this particular sequence 
uh, the chapter of his home is the Dalai Lama. Well, at least taught in 2014, I believe. Yeah, 2014. And oftentimes his home is teaches 26, 18, and 24. So on this occasion, his home is the Dalai Lama. He added a few verses. And based on that, I translated this. I prepared this text. The reason being that this, of course, is very long. And to teach all of it would take a really long time. And so I thought, at least I go according to those chapters and then see how it goes. Um, if it works and people find this helpful, we could add a few more, for instance. Well, one is already there, one is really hard. Hmm. And then seven, two, seven, etc. Let's just see how it goes over the next few years. Not here, not doing this course. <laughs> um, the goal for this course would be to do half, so 26, 18, and 23, and then to do the rest next year, depending on how fast we go, okay? So I'd like to go through each verse according to how I've been, what I've been explained, and uh, do meditations, so to give you the opportunity to internalize what you learn. And this is Buddhism for on. <laughs> this is no not watering it down, etc. So, of course, you just take what you like, whatever you can accept, so you don't need to accept anything. But from my side, I'll talk about past and future lives, I'll talk about karma, it has to be, it's part of this. So this is like going right into it, uh, which is why this is actually an advanced course. So we'll see what you take from it, what you find helpful, you may leave the rest. And please also, to listen, to listen with a self-reflective type of mind, to not just listen with a mind that wants to understand the words, but once you've understood some aspects, I'm not sure everything will be clear right away, but whatever you understand, to listen with a self-reflective kind of attitude. So how does this apply to me, to my own experience, to my personal life, to my relationship with relationships with others, etc. And through the meditation that will hopefully become, uh, well, even more helpful as in like taking it in a self-reflective way, internalizing it, applying, to, applying these ideas to your own life. Okay, and of course, at the back of your mind, always be skeptical about whatever you hear. Uh, we'll have time for questions. I'll, I'd like to keep those towards the end. And of course, I've translated this text from the Tibetan text, so Boaz very kindly, he's brought his own text, I hope he has, yeah. <laughs> so Boaz knows Sanskrit, so he will follow with the original Sanskrit text and then make uh, definitely invaluable suggestions about uh, different words or different ways of translating it, which would be very helpful. So just to get a better understanding, because of course, um, the Sanskrit language has, one word can have so many different meanings, it can be translated, it can be read in different ways, uh, so you can understand it this way, you can understand it that way, and through this method understand much fuller what the author is trying to say. Then the text being translated into Tibetan, uh, with the Tibetan language, it's not as uh, it's not like Sanskrit that it has so many different meanings, that it can be interpreted in so many different ways. There's still different ways of interpreting it, but it just doesn't have that, um, what's the word, um, those facets in, in the Tibetan language. And of course in English, we have to choose saying it one way and not in a different way. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, catch the intent, we'll be able to um, get into the, the intent of Nagarjuna really fully inter interpret it correctly and then uh, are able to uh, practice it in the correct way. But of course there's so many commentaries, so I've used many of the different commentaries when I translated it and I hope it will become clear as we go along. Alright, so to say a little bit about the author, well, this book was written by Nagarjuna, the great Nagarjuna who lived, it's not, not really that clear, like 
first century of this common era, second century of this common era. Um, and um, he is said to be one of the 84 Mahasiddhas of the great accomplished ones, the great uh, masters in India. So he was one of the, these great 84 uh, practitioners or masters of the past. And he has composed so many texts. He's kind of, he's sometimes regarded as like the, the second Buddha. So there are, um, there are even texts, like even, even uh, kind of sections in the Buddha's teachings when the Buddha was asked, what are we gonna do once you're gone? And so in response to that, the Buddha said, well, don't worry, someone is gonna come called Nagarjuna. And he's gonna basically explain what I've taught you. He'll explain it again, he'll reinterpret it and, and guide you so that you won't uh, lose what I've taught you. So for instance, it says here, let me just find the right page. This is a commentary by Lama Tsongkhapa in which, okay, wait, let me just find it. Oh, here it is. So it says here in the descent into Lanka Sutra or Lanka Vatara Sutra the vehicle of discriminative wisdom is not subject to the comprehensions of sophists. Okay, that's separate. After the passing away of the protector, the Buddha, please tell me who would hold the tradition thereafter. Okay, so after the passing away, uh, what are we going to do, basically? And so the Buddha responds, says, you, the wise man, should know that after the parinibbana of the Buddha, the holder of the system will come after some time has passed in the land of Vidarva in the south, one widely renowned as the monk Sri who will be named Naga, destroying the positions of nihilism and reificationism. He will propound my vehicle in the world, the Supreme Mahayana, will achieve the profound of joyfulness and he will then ascend to the blissful land. Okay, so that is one quote saying that Nagarjuna is gonna come, even at the time of the Buddha, he already said, Nagarjuna, some person will come and you can trust him. So he will explain again, emptiness the main topic, um, one of the main topics the Buddha taught. And then there are other sutras, um, the Mahameka Sutra it's called. 400 years after my passing away, this boy will become a monk named Naga and will disseminate my doctrine. Eventually he will become the victor named Nanakara Prabha in the land called Prasava Prabha. Okay, never mind the latter part. Um, and then there's also a quote saying that he would live for 600 years. Now that seems very long. <laughs> um, and some people take that literally, that he was really, he lived for such a long time. And other people say, no, there were like several Nagarjunas. There were several great masters with the same name. And so they just wrote these different texts at different times. These are quotes from the tradition or No, um, those are all from the Mahayana Sutras. Because this was in the context also of teaching, giving a Mahayana teachings. So, and I don't know, maybe they are in the Pali tradition, but I haven't come across any sutras. These are usually the sutras that they quote. Um, anyway, so, having said so, and then Nagarjuna, someone called Nagarjuna, along around that time, 500 years after the Buddha's passing away, or 400 years after the Buddha passing away, around that time, um, and sure enough, introduced emptiness, well, introduced, reintroduced emptiness, in the sense that after the Buddha, when the Buddha was around, he taught emptiness. But these teachings became quite, they were not taught to the main, not taught to like a, a vast group of people. They were taught to some select people. Uh, because, well, at that time, not everyone would have understood them. There was danger of people misunderstanding them. So the Buddha didn't teach to that, like, a, like to a vast 
number of peoples, but to a few select. But there were other teachings, such as Four Noble Truth, etc. He taught those much more widely. Um, tantric teachings, of course, were extremely secret. So this is why the kind of mainstream teachings, they were passed on thereafter, the ones that he taught to a huge audience, were brought to Sri Lanka, to Thailand, etc., like to different countries. Uh, but then the teachings in particular on emptiness, the, what are called the Prashnaparamita sutras, or the teachings on uh, the perfection of wisdom, or the Paramita of wisdom, they were just kept in a, in, a, in a smaller group because of the worry that it won't be understood. It was, it, it's so profound, those teachings are so profound. Um, and eventually they they were brought to the land of Nagas, whether that's literally like a serpent land or another interpretation is a place called Nagaland that the teachings were brought there. And um, Nagarjuna basically took them back from there and made them more publicly known by explaining them in his texts. In Well, one of the texts here being the text we're going to study. The text we're going to study is the main text. And actually, the Buddha, when he taught, he taught by way of turning three wheels, three wheels of Dharma. It's in the Mayana tradition or in the Nalanda tradition. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, often refers to it as the Sanskrit tradition. According to the Sanskrit tradition, the Buddha taught three wheels. And during the first wheel, he explained the Four Noble Truths. Uh, he gave the kind of foundational teachings, the foundation for everything. But at the same time, he taught phenomena exist truly. They exist inherently. He taught this um, for certain disciples, for the benefit of um, certain disciples. Um, he taught that for the benefit of many and they make sure you're warm. I don't. I, I'm. I'm. In, I'm. Have my summer dress on. I know it's always very warm. I'm. This is my summer stuff. So you. You need to be warm. That's most important. Um, so the Buddha taught that all phenomena exist in and of themselves. They exist inherently. You'll hear later on. The Buddha even talked about. To some people, he even taught a self. He said phenomena. There is really a self. There is an independent self. There was a purpose for teaching so, and it's mentioned in here. Um, anyway, so he taught Four Noble Truths, etc., but in the context of saying everything exists truly inherently. That was the first turning of the wheel. And then he also turned the second, he, did, did, he introduced the second turning of the wheel, which is the um, wheel of the Prashnaparamita Sutras, the wheel of good, to, of, of, uh, um, characterlessness, if you like. So a phenomena not existing by way of their own character. In other words, teaching that nothing exists inherently. He taught that during the second turning of the wheel. So nothing exists truly, nothing exists inherently. So you can see, first, during the first wheel, he said everything exists truly, everything exists inherently. During the second wheel, he said nothing does. So that was confusing for quite a few people. Which is why during the third turning of the wheel, he discerned. He said, well, some phenomena exist truly and some don't. Okay. Again, according to the needs of certain disciples. At the same time, he also talked about the nature of the mind. He talked about Buddha nature. Um, so the third, wheel, the third turning of the wheel is also characterized by teachings on the nature of the mind. Um, well, our clear nature of the mind, the fact that our mind not in the nature, or the afflictions are not in the nature of our mind, so therefore we can remove them. So in that way, he taught about the clear nature of the mind, and therefore this served as a bridge to us for the tantric teachings, which he also, they're also kind of part of the third turning of the wheel. And uh, His Holiness, there's a very famous quote that was given by the Buddha himself. This is from the sutras, where the Buddha says, profound, peaceful, free of elaborations, radiant, unproduced. I found a truth like nectar. This was, this was right after the Buddha attained enlightenment. So this, this truth he found is profound, peaceful, free of elaborations, radiant, unproduced. A truth like nectar. No one I teach this, no one I teach this to will understand it. So I will not speak about it. I will hide in the forest. 
So that's what he initially said, feeling that the time hadn't come yet to give these teachings, so he didn't teach right away. He said he spent some time in the forest, I think it was 49 days or 47 days, I always get confused about the exact numbers. But time just wasn't ready yet for the Buddha to set forth these teachings. But actually His Holiness has recently started to explain those first words in the first line, profound, peaceful, free of elaborations, radiant, unproduced, and connecting them to the three wheels, explains those words as in being, referring to the meaning of the three wheels. So profound and peaceful, that's the first wheel. The first wheel as in like teaching the path to liberation, to eliminating the afflictions, that is profound. And then it leads to the cessation of the afflictions and therefore the cessation of suffering, that is peaceful. So those first two words, profound, peaceful. And then the words free of liberation, that refers to the second turning of the wheel emptiness, free of elaborations of mis the misapprehension of reality. And then the last turning, in particular when the Buddha teaches, not in here, no, no, <laughs> sorry, I just wrote it here, like okay. my personal notes, oh, this is confusing, yeah, sorry, it's not in here. No, no, I just added it a few moments ago. So, radiant, unproduced, those are the words, radiant, unproduced, so those uh, last two words from the first line, refer to the last turning of the wheel. The mind is radiant, as in like the mind is in the, mind is in the nature of clear light. It's in the nature of radiance. It can take anything to mind. It's pure light, clear light. And unproduced, the, la the mind lacks inherent existence. So that is another way of referring to Buddha nature. So Buddha nature in the sense that the mind is clear, the mind is free from all the afflictions. Our mind is not in the nature of the afflictions, or the afflictions are not in the nature of our mind, it's actually pure. Anything can be taken on by the mind, anything can be apprehended by the mind, plus the fact that the unproduced nature, so the lack of inherent existence, since the mind doesn't exist intrinsically, independently, and so forth, we can change the mind. It can be changed if we, if we accumulate the right kind of causes and conditions, if we create the right kind of conditions, then the mind can be transformed into the mind of a Buddha. So that is also described as Buddha nature, which is described, which is taught in the third turning of the wheel. So therefore, profound, peaceful, first turning of the wheel, free of liberation, second, radiant, unproduced, last. So it's really beautiful, this explanation, because if this is what the Buddha was referring to, he was, even before he taught, he would say already, oh, during, I, I'm going to teach this, but not for now. I wait a little bit because people's minds are just not ready to teach this. But once they're ready, I'll teach. And then he set forth the three turnings of the wheel, okay, in the way just described. So, to think of the Buddha, the way to to think of the Buddha, he was not systematic in the sense that he he kind of gave teachings. Okay, so this today I'm going to give this teaching, maybe just on the Vaibhashika view, or just on the Satantrika, start off with this, then do this. I mean, there was some system, of course, to it, starting off with saying everything exists the way you think, the way it appears to you, but watch out for suffering and the, the afflictions, etc. But still not going like all the way into emptiness. And then going fully into emptiness, and then thereafter kind of explaining it kind of elaborating on it. So in that sense, you could say there's a system, but more individually from the point of view of teaching different people, he was basically, if you imagine, he was walking around India, and people were, many people, I guess not everyone, but those who, who, who were open to it, who were ready for it, were already attracted by his radiance, by his charisma, and then the Buddha approached them and, and uh, they would ask, please teach, as it was customary in India, like you met a teacher, you would request the teacher to teach. And right there on the spot, the Buddha taught according to the individual person, to their needs, to their, according to their interests, their aspiration, their predispositions, uh, their capa capacity to comprehend different ideas. And just right there on the spot, the Buddha gave a, the perfect teaching for that person. It was just right for them. And then he moved on, met other 
disciples, other students, and again taught according to what they needed. And some of what 